Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required, and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. License to practice. When an organization wants an enterprise architect, it tends to want someone who can do a lot, know a lot, cover a lot of ground, with experience and training to deliver good outcomes. Perhaps that is a little different from any other role in an organization. But what makes EAs tough to source then? Maybe it's because most people doing the sourcing don't know what good looks like. We often say to ourselves that it's not well understood by others as a practice. So why would we expect them to recognize what a good one looks like? Also, how can you demonstrate goodness in EA? The results are often much later or hard to attribute directly. This is why when I turn up at an airport as someone who has only once been in the cockpit of a plane that wasn't on the ground, and that was as a small child back in the days when you're allowed to do that, I can't test that the pilot has the right capability to fly that plane. Nor can I personally check their flying history. I can, however, expect that they have a certified license to practice from their industry. So, before organisations can put complete faith in us as EAs, our industry needs to provide that same licence to practice. Welcome everyone to Toolkit Tuesday Special Edition and uh, glad you're with us wherever you are in the world. My thanks uh, as ever to Paul Herman, uh, Distinguished Engineer at IBM UK. Um, what a great key up to today's session. Um, Paul talks about uh, having a license to practice. Well, today we're talking about not quite that, but uh, but something close. But before I go there and introduce it, uh, as I say, welcome wherever you are. Um, please do, those of you who've, who've attended one of these before know, we love to know where you are in the world. Um, please share on in the chat channel if you uh, uh, are able to. Uh, we'd love to know where you are. And um, one point about questions. If you have questions today, then please, uh, if at all possible, put them in the Q&A channel. Um, and if you can't see that right now on your screen, if you click on the three little dots in the bottom right hand corner, that will uh, give you the chance to open the Q&A channel and put any questions in there. And uh, I'll get to as many of them as possible um, for our panelists today. So we do have we do have three speakers today. So so time is tight, but uh, I talked about the intro from from Paul Homan and the uh, and the license to practice. Many of you uh, here will know the open group for, among other things, our uh, our knowledge based certification programs like uh, like TOGAF, Archimate, OAA, the IT for IT standard, Open Fair, etc. But we do have and have had for a while um, a, a different type of certi certification. A, a, a experience and, and knowledge based certification program, which we call the open professions and without telling you more about what that is, because you will hear about that. I'm going to uh, dive straight in today and uh, introduce our three panelists who will talk to you about their experience of this program and their journey. So today uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague Andres Sakal. He's vice president and CTO at the open group. Uh, a recognized expert, expert on supply chain security, cloud architecture, and cybersecurity. He's widely recognized as driving force behind the ISO IEC 2243, better known as the Open Trusted Technology Provider Standard here at the Open Group. And also, a re really the hat he's wearing today, his tireless work to establish um, recognized 
professional credentials for technology professionals through the creation of the Open Professions Programme. And joining Andres today, we have Tony Black, who's Global Director for the Kindrel Cloud Practice. Tony has more than 20 years of uh, IT and software expertise. He's an active member, I should say very active member, uh, of the Open Group in general, but specifically the Healthcare Forum, the Security Forum, and the Digital Practitioners Work Group. And he is chair of the Open Professions Work Group here at the Open Group. He's also a member of, elected member of the Open Group Governing Board, where he helps provide the vision and growth for the organization, whilst maintaining seven Open Group certifications. Yes, seven, including uh, a Distinguished Technical Specialist and Distinguished Architect, which you'll hear a little more about today. And last but by no means least, uh, Leng Sokal is Vice President and Consulting Expert at CGI Federal. And Leng has more than 30 years uh, of IT experience in infrastructure management, cloud implementation, security, software development, intelligent automation, and te technical architecture. She leads projects in development modernization and enhancement, as well as the operations and maintenance of large financial systems for the US government. So a warm welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, uh, special edition, please, for Andres Sakal, Tony Black, and Leng Sakal. Over to you, I think you're first, Andres. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Really appreciate it. And uh, welcome to everybody uh, to another Tuesday uh, where we put some additional kit in your personal toolbox. Uh, look, uh, a lot of folks have, you know, been asking me, why am I so passionate about open professions and how is it that I could have put, you know, 20 plus years of effort into this? And I have spoken at large around how we have uh, come to the structure that we arrived at and if you were interested in that please you know go to the youtube channel and find out more about that but i'm going to talk about why uh and what made me so passionate because i think that experience will resonate with a lot of folks who are trying to move through their careers so post grad school uh, my first first real job was as an IT professional was working for a large telecommunication company on a very, very large uh, government project, uh, which was worth billions to the company. And they literally hired everybody out of my graduate class. And it was so important that they, they, they sequestered us uh, in a, a different building away from the rest of the corporate culture. Um, so really wasn't until three years later that we got into production and we did some amazing things that one of the managers, you know, dropped a binder on the desk and said, hey, you guys might be interested in the technical ladder and you should learn more about what it means to be part of the company. And, you know, it was then and there that I, I learned, you know, more about what it means to be, you know, uh, working through a technical ladder, what it means to be working uh, your way through your career as an IT professional, um, you know, you know, ideas like bands and roles. I didn't really know anything about what those were. So feeling my oats, I put my package together and I submitted it. But when the time came and the results came back, I was disappointed and a bit depressed that I was not selected. I recounted my, you know, surprise to my mentor and, and, and then manager, a guy named Chuck Dean, who listened to me and said, well, I, I certainly think you're qualified. You've done some really uh, great things for the company, uh, but that doesn't always translate into opportunity or recognition, you know, and that was really one of my first, you know, kind of uh, realizations. And I, so. At that point, uh, he said, hey, you know, why don't you go talk to some of the committee members, some of the people on the board? And I did. I went straight to the top and I was surprised to even get an audience with the VP. And uh, it was then and there they said, yeah, you, you, you've done some really great things, uh, but um, you really don't know how to articulate them. You don't know, uh, you know and you don't understand what we're looking for. Uh, you need to learn how to convey your experience, uh, those accomplishments that you know really move the company forward, those experiences that that led to success in the in in the projects, and how to convey them in in your package. 
It's actually those experiences that we care most about when selecting leaders at the next level. Um, and not only did I not understand the implications of what the business needed, but instead of conveying my experience in the package, I was really just conveying a bunch of technical accomplishments that really nobody but me cared about, right? Uh, so I was a little frustrated. Um, and, and there was a bit of a secret handshake there. So, yes, eventually I worked through that. I learned what they were looking for. I learned how to write my experiences and convey them in a way that uh, it, it, it made sense to the company. Uh, and it reflected on not only what I could had accomplished, but what I could do. Um, but what was really missing in that pro process was, you know, the, a defined set of criteria, a level playing field for you know, a technical professional um, so that they could actually move through their career to aspire be to become something one day that might be, you know, a technical executive. So this really, you know, drove me uh, to make a case for uh, defining the open profession standards. Uh, when I joined my next company, IBM, and uh, they were very supportive and recognized the need to have consistency across the organization. So I really wanted to, you know, make it so that a manager's arbitrary desire to reward their, you know, favorites, um, you know, was no longer an element of the process. And it no longer held back those that deserve the recognition, uh, you know, to to being a level playing field. And that's where, you know, we came up with this idea of of establishing uh, a, uh, a certification standard and a certification program and framework uh, that is globally recognized, provides, you know, an objective, reliable set of measurable capabilities and quantifications and really ensures more efficient, successful recruiting process because it's standardized. And this enables all organizations to be more formal about their technical ladder uh, and, and how to recognize career pro progression. And obviously this helps identify the best candidates too, right? So now we have fast forward, uh, been operating for you know, almost 24 years um, you know, we launched uh, formally in 2005, but we had been working on this program uh, for several years prior to that. So it's been a while and it continues to evolve. And we have the OpenCA, uh, which is the certification at three levels for uh, different types or disciplines of architects. Uh, we have the uh, Open Certified Data Scientists. Um, which uh, helps support data scientists, and, and they have actually even added a uh, associate badge to help people understand how to move from early career to um, becoming a professional. And then, of course, you know, the uh, very broad technical specialties, which include all of the streams that you might consider to be kind of vertical technical specialists, like database engineers and so on and so forth, security specialists. And then our newest one is uh, related to understanding how cybersecurity and supply chain security um, have and, and recognize how prominent and important those are now today to enterprise and uh, securing their environment. So just to go over real quickly what the process is, you know, we have a, a career, a stepwise career path to certification that is recognized in milestones uh, via badges and you get your professional communication badge, which is basically understanding how you as a technical professional go about the process of um, representing your work and experience. Uh, you know, you have to continue to take those uh, classes that keep you relevant. That's defined in pro professional development. And then, of course, the all important experience profiles that define your success and projects that lead you to the board and a recognition of your peers uh, that you are uh, you know, able to meet the criteria at a certain level. So that's that board evaluation. So 
I'm going to pass it over to Ling, and she's going to tell you a little bit about her own experience here. Sure. Oh, when I was in my mid-career, and this was close to 20 years ago, I thought it would be great for my resume that I added a certification around the work I was doing that is in technical architecture and software engineering. And I started looking around for the certification programs available at that time. That was when I learned about the Open CA certification. What struck me about the certification was that it didn't require me to study. It didn't require me to attend classes and take exams. So immediately I thought I could breeze through the certification. Of course, as soon as I started the program, I realized I was mistaken. The program required me to submit detailed evidence of my experience that aligned with the conformance criteria. And these conformance criteria are related to the technical uh, architectural discipline skills, as well as the soft skills that include communication, professional development, business knowledge, etc. So to get started, I first have to recall all the accomplishments that I had in the previous years and figure out a way to curate my stories so that I can make a compelling submission. And I did find gaps in my experience. And for those, I actually tried to find opportunities or even create opportunities to get the experience. So for instance, when it came to contribution back to the community, I signed up to be a mentor. And this was one thing that I wanted to do for a while, but never carved out the time and the certification process made me do it and give back, which is a good thing. So in the end, the investment of time and effort I put into the application was certainly larger than what I initially thought, but I feel that the certification process and the outcome of the certification process were also larger than I anticipated. And for these reasons, the Open CA certification is different from a knowledge-based certification that qualifies you based on your knowledge on a subject matter. A good analogy is the training that the medical student has to go through, where he or she has to sit for classroom exams, and then there is a, two, a, a few years of residency where the student gets exposed to the experience of treating different diseases. Similarly, for IT professionals, we have our classroom exams. We have knowledge-based certifications that are important. And then we keep on learning on the job. That's when the Open CA or the open professions programs come in to assess our level of maturity, our range of experience, and our ability to use the skills that we have acquired to solve real world IT challenges. And that is why I feel a sense of achievement, a strong sense of achievement to attain the Open CA certification. And also a sense of pride that I have been qualified by fellow architects in the industry, which is part of the program structure. And even after getting the certification, I feel I continue to benefit from going through the process because I am now aware of the desired traits of a high functioning architect, and I would apply the disciplines and the behaviors in the work that I do every day. And for these reasons, the Open CA journey has been a valuable experience for me, and the outcome was also rewarding to my career. Now, 
hand it over to Tony. Thank you, Andras. Thank you, Lane. Um, when thinking about the uh, Open Professions Program, there's two key elements that, that I want to highlight. One is technical eminence, and the other one is personal branding. So when you think about technical eminence, uh, think about that, that go-to person on your team or in your organization, uh, within your organization, who's, who's, who seemingly has all of the answers, right? They're, they're, the ones that, they're the ones that are deemed the ones that you go to for your key critical uh, solutions and, uh, and, and to help you figure things out. They're the, the, the in-office expert, right, so to speak, because of their technical acumen, the contributions that they have, the way leadership uh, looks upon them. But not only are they the go-to resource or the expert for assistance, but they're able to, com to effectively communicate their knowledge and their answers to you, to where you are actually understanding and learning from them, right? They make good mentors because they can groom and guide you and help you understand exactly what it is to be a technical professional. That's what we mean by technical eminence. That's, that's something that you can control and that you can grow. And it's also an element of your brand, of your personal branding, right? What is the branding? Personal branding is how you're perceived, how you're recognized, how you're acknowledged by your leadership, by the industry that you're in, whether that's healthcare, finance, et cetera, by other leaders, by employers, by your peers. It's how, you rep it's how you're represented and how you're perceived. And that includes things like your accomplishments, your achievements, your degrees, more importantly, certifications and credentials and the experiences that you have. So when you think about the Open Professions Program, think about increasing your technical eminence and growing your personal branding. And again, these are things that you can control. And as you think about them, keep in mind, these are things that you want to, that you want to, you want to toy with when trying to understand and make that decision. Why should I adopt the Open Professions Program? What will this do for me? And how can I actually navigate and guide this to where it's going to make sense for me? Right? So think about the technical journey that you're on. Think about the milestones that you've laid out for yourself. Right? It helps with identification and recognition of those milestones. What about the, what about the opportunities that can, that can be afforded to me? Maybe speaking engagements at conferences, mentoring, uh, mentoring opportunities for other individuals, increasingly increasing your branding and obtaining additional certifications, credentials, and growing your experience. These are the things that you want to think about while you're wondering, okay, I want, I, I want to increase my eminence. I want to, I want to increase my branding. How will the Open Professions Program help me focus on that? These are some key areas where this program will help you focus on that. And you've heard me mention certifications, credentials. Why are certifications considered, considered important? Well, for, for one, they indicate focus and discipline. And of course, there's time, there's energy, there's effort that goes into that. It just doesn't happen overnight. But it indicates focus and discipline. And it, and it allows you to actually grow your experiences. So as you're able to increase your experience, it simply amplifies the importance and the value of that focus discipline for that specific certification and credential. Right? It helps employers, it helps companies identify where is the technical professional talent within my organization. I want to retain, that helps me identify and understand who to retain, how to grow my business through accredited expertise, allowing me to recognize the value of these technical professionals through things like Andras mentioned, the, the technical ladder expanding your eminence, not just internally towards the company, but also within an industry and globally with external recognition, because it's, it's always someone who is trying to seek that right validated expertise. Certifications, credentials help that happen. And lastly, 
If you're excited about, if you're excited at all about anything you've heard this morning thus far, and I hope you are, let me bring it together with this. Later this fall, the Open Professions Program is going to be launching office hours. This is going to give you the opportunity to participate, ask questions, under, get a better understanding about earning credentials, earning certifications, about the four areas that we've just discussed, right? We've talked about certified architect, technical specialist, data scientist, trusted technology practitioner. These are the areas that you could come in and ask questions about, right? So any questions, all questions, everyone who's interested or focused or curious or wants to learn more, partake in the office hours. So we're going to be launching that later this fall. So you need to stay locked and loaded uh, for that. How do you do that? If you're not already following us, now's the time to go to LinkedIn and follow us or subscribe to our YouTube channel. These are where we're going to be making those announcements because you want to be aware. This is where we this is where we distribute information, knowledge, and awareness about our offerings. So, with that, I won't belabor this anymore. I'll turn it back over to Steve for Q and A. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, and obviously Ling and Andres too. Um, it's it's really hard to <clears throat> summarize. Um, Actually, what an important, valuable program this is in a very short time. So, uh, thank you for uh, for doing that. We'll we'll uh, go straight to uh, some questions. Ah, there you all are on the screen. Wonderful. Um, without the slides, great. So, um, we'll we'll go straight to some some questions. Um, uh, one that we hear quite a bit, um, and indeed today, I I work on internal projects, not with external clients. Is that experience still acceptable under the program? Who wants to take that one? Well, I'll, I'll take it. Okay. Oh, you, want to, you want to take it, Andres? No, go ahead, Tony. Go for it. Sure. Yes. A client is who you service, whether right. that's internal or external. It doesn't matter. We all have clients. So don't get caught up and stress out about they're not a customer or they're, they're an internal team. Your client is your client, whether they're internal or external. So just talk about the value, the benefit, what you do, why it's meaningful, why it's impactful, and take it from that perspective. Right. And Tony, don't forget, we also have uh, a, an entire standard and process for accrediting organizations so that they can manage their own recognized open profession program. And that allows them to actually keep in-house uh, their certification boards if they choose to do so. So that helps, you know, kind of hide the secret sauce if you if you really need to do that. We also try to, you know, basically get you the right board members in the right industry when, when you know, you do come direct. Right. That's a good point. Thank, thank you both. So um, next question, maybe I can come to you for this one, Leng. This is as somebody that's had recent experience of the program as uh, as well. Um, do you, when you submit your application, do you need to submit your documents, presentations, and other artifacts? How how does that work from a from an applicant's point of view? So I just uh, acquired my level two master certification, so the experience has is quite fresh in my mind. Right. Uh, the as you've heard in the earlier slide um, presentation, the application process provides various steps that lead you from the milestone submission, where you provide evidence of your experience or the conformance criteria related to communication, and that's one milestone, and then Again, you do the same for professional development, and then you work on the experience profile, three of them in my case for level two, where you describe your experience in delivering to an end-to-end -end project. So this, this could be external projects, client-facing or internal projects, doesn't matter. So long as you demonstrate within that end-to-end -end implementation all the different desired disciplines that this program is evaluating your your um, capability on. 
It's a great answer. Thank you. As, as I said, I know you've recently. Congratulations on the level two, by the way. Uh, so uh, great to hear. Uh, Andres, I'm going to come to you for this one as somebody who uh, uh, was instrumental in, in putting the program together uh, in the first place. Um, do I have to go through the different levels, uh, one, two, three, um, in order, or can I dive in somewhere, or can I go straight to three if I'm experienced, or well, what that's are the a, That's a that? really good, ex good question, especially for somebody who is actually performing already at a very high level. You yeah. know, you don't want to start all the way uh, from the beginning, right? So um, the core of the program is level two. That is where you are basically mastered the state of the art. You know, level one is all about performing, but with oversight. You're learning to become a professional. And then two, it, level two master certification is uh, the level, the core level. And level three is about extending the state of the art, being an executive type of uh, technical person who who leads uh, probably recognized in the industry, uh, done some really innovative things, right? So, uh, you can come right into the program at level two and, uh, and obtain additional badges for level three and get level three certified. So most people do come in to the program at level two, uh, quite often. Um, because they're not starting out early in their career, they're already professionals, so they want to prove that. So starting off at level two is uh, certainly uh, acceptable. And then you can, if you have the credentials, easily move on to level three. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And um, you know, just as importantly, I got some some feedback recently from uh, our, our fabulous um, event held in, in Delhi uh, week before last. Um, on this program, and the the feedback there was, you know, there was a there was a feeling that that folks have to wait um, for a certain you know amount of experience in their careers before, look, you know, kind of looking back on the pro, uh, looking back on their career and then submitting. And clearly, what Tony's talking about from a you know the the office hours and the un, trying to, to encourage people undergraduates, we we can. We can invite people into the program at an earlier, earlier stage and have them use the the milestones as as guidance on their career path. Is am I understanding that correctly? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. If you're an undergraduate or a graduate and you have capstone projects that you've participated on and completed, right. those actually those that's valid evidence that you that, that that can get you started on these credentials and your journey early on before you become a professional while you're still in academia. Right. Oh, absolutely. Right. Especially using the associate badge now. Right. Right. Okay, folks. We are uh, we are actually out out of time here. I I uh, do see there's a there's a request for um, the links to the YouTube um, and uh, LinkedIn channels. So um, uh, we will uh, try and put those in the. Uh, if we can get those added in the chat before we shut down, that will be that will be most helpful. Um, so uh, thank you for. Uh, in the meanwhile, thank you to um, to Andras, to Leng, and to Tony. Uh, there's so much more to this program. Um, do take a look. There's a lot of information on our um, on our website um, about this and uh, different different paths to go through the program. So uh, I do encourage people to take a look and. Uh, and uh, it, it's there. It's to help your your career development and to help your organisations uh, along the way too, of course. So um, we'll draw a line under that topic for today. Thank you all uh, again for attending. I incidentally, I, I said we love to know. Uh, thank you for putting those links in there. There, I said we love to know where you all are. Um, and just on what I was able to see, uh, just of those of you who put put us in the chat, we we. Uh, had folks here today from from the UK, USA, Canada, India, various cities in India, South Africa, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, Italy, and Malaysia. So uh, it is a global audience here at the Talk It Tuesday Special Editions, and we're very proud of it. Next time uh, we we haven't the, the next time we uh, do this will be August the thirteenth, Tuesday, August the thirteenth, of course, uh, and the focus will be uh, the Open Trusted Technology Provider Standard in the uh, 
realms of supply chain security uh, it's a it's a great standard that we have mentioned earlier in this uh, presentation as uh, part of Andres's bio too in helping create that so that's all for today folks uh, oh and we have somebody from Amman thank you um, that's all for today, folks. We'll wrap it up. Uh, love to get your feedback. Um, uh, do do put anything you can in the chat. We'll hold it open for just a couple of minutes and uh, hope to see you all next time. Wherever you are, be safe. This was Toolkit Tuesday Special Edition. Thank you.